As you can see, Michele is wearing this strange cap. We are recording uh, his brain, a spontaneous brain uh, electrical activity. So as to figure out which is the intention that Michele wants to convey to that small robot. So you see that the robot has a small screen, so as people can see the patient. Um, the robot has also a camera, so that the patient can see the family, and he can drive the robot. Briefly, what we are showing now is that we can determine, first, when the person wants to deliver intentionally mental commands to the device, when the person doesn't want to deliver mental commands, and then there is some intelligence on board of this small mobile robot that will keep executing whatever it was executing. The analogy here is you are driving your car. Once you are in the right of highway, you don't need to think much. You simply keep moving forward until you decide to pass over another car or take the exit. This is the second point, and more importantly, the fact that people can keep the same level of mental control independently of whether or not they are executing other mental tasks. Because this is what will facilitate at the end of the day that people can routinely use brain-machine interfaces 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there are a number of ways to try and get a neural interface, and the one we have developed we call targeted muscle reinnervation. What we do is use the nerves that are still left. Although the arm is lost, the nerves come down from the brain through the spinal cord and out into the periphery, in, and they're functional. So we take some of the muscles and cut away those nerves, put in the amputated arm nerves and let them grow into that muscle, and muscle becomes the biological amplifier. Specifically in Glenn's case, his biceps has two sides, so we cut the nerve to one side and put his hand closing nerve there, the median nerve. After it grew in, now Glenn thinks um, bend elbow and his left upper biceps will contract and he uses that to bend his elbow. If he thinks close hand, now the nerve goes to the medial biceps and makes it contract. He's not thinking about contracting his biceps. He's thinking close his hand, and his hand closes. And in this way, we can get um, simultaneous control of his elbow and hand in an intuitive manner. Our question was, can we take these clinical data being inspired by a brain disease and an alteration of self-consciousness, and can we transfer this to the research laboratory? In order to do this, Bruno, if you could uh, just show the presentations. What we have taken is, are we able to change the perspective and location where our conscious subjects um, um, report to be? And we did this by taking again evidence from these out-of-body experience. So we induced a two-meter distance, and we filmed, as you, we will show now here with a little a demonstration, the subject's own body from two meters behind. So remember, this is the same distance than out-of-body experience patients uh, report spontaneously. And then we apply another error signal. Normally, when you see your body, whether it's a stimulus that is approaching your arm and touching your arm, you, seal, you see the touch and you feel the touch at the same location. Now, this is very simply modified here uh, in this technique because you have a distance. So what Michael is seeing here, um, he sees from this camera's position here, and he feels, of course, the touches that Bruno is um, applying to his body at his back, but he sees them two meters in front. And by performing this kind of very simple stimulation where we have much more sophisticated ways and computerized versions to do this in the lab, there's three sensations, three aspects of self-consciousness that we can modify. First of all, Michael will feel the touch where he sees the touch. Normally we feel the touch where we feel the touch. He sees it at the avatar's position. And there is also an identification with that virtual body that we uh, measure on questionnaires. And then we have a large array of other measures um, where reaction times and also where we can ma ma manipulate where he experiences to be. Because after this experiment, if Bruno would stop, we blindfold him, we, ask, we displace him, we ask him to return to the position. But people don't return to the position where they have been standing. They walk too far. They walk too far into the direction where the avatar was standing. So we can, thanks Michael, we can systematically change where people localize to be. Well, this is a fundamental aspect of self-consciousness that we should not get wrong. So I'm working with monkeys, and monkeys are implanted with these arrays of electrodes. 
These arrays have hundreds of recording sites from them, and we can record action potentials from individual neurons in the brain. And then we look at this pattern of activity, and again, we go through a decoding algorithm, a very simple decoding algorithm, and we can pull out the intention to move your arm, and we can get very complex representations of these arm movements. He has uh, many electrodes in his brain, uh, and he's working this arm that has the um, ability to move anywhere in space, X, Y, Z position in space, and to move this arm in three dimensions, just like your own, or this wrist, just like your own wrist. And the idea then is we present this cylinder, and he has to take this arm and orient it, and then close the hand around this object. And so this is what we call seven degree of freedom uh, control, and you can see he can do all this simultaneously. 